Right. Hi. Hi. We are now with John Anderson, the wonderful composer, lyricist, and beautiful human being whose words and music has touched and graced the hearts of millions of people. Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing fine. Very nice introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, it's. I think we all of us, we get at a, a point in our life when we just look at where we're at, where we want to go, and where we've been. And hopefully we're all in flow with everything, that we're in flow with nature, we're in flow with mankind, which unfortunately tends to be out of balance with nature. But one, yeah. of, the, one of the reasons I wanted to, to have this conversation is because I had an epiphany, oh, about a week and a half ago. I was watching a DVD of the concert at Montreux from 2003. And right after the performance of Don't Kill the Whales, you started talking about Don't Kill the Butterflies, Don't Kill the Birds, we're all part of na it's all nature, and without nature we're everything, where there's nothing wrong. How do you want to? How what what does that feel like now? And all your your years one, uh, of of creating is that feeling still with you? Well, fortunately, I'm surrounded by birds and animals in the gardens here. We feed them every day, and they come and they sing to us, and the music is all around us. So. Mother Earth is so, so wonderful and so powerful, and uh, through the years, as you say, you know, you go up to appreciate nature so much, and uh, last night I was walking around the garden of the stars. It's just unbelievable the amount of stars that are out there, and uh, I think sometimes a lot of people could do with that, walking around looking at the stars. It's very healthy. Well, not, not only do I, I feel it's healthy, but... I, ha I live in South Florida, so it's uh, very easy to see the stars at night. Um, I used to live in North Jersey, you know, right near New York, and it wasn't so easy. But something about looking into the night sky, I've always discovered to be something that enables the dreamer within all of us. Do you know what I mean? True, true. It's, it's, um, it's part of our experience that we... We, we do tend to forget that we're surrounded by so much energy and we just look at it and see it and that's all it is. No, there's more to flowers, there's more, more to trees than we could ever imagine. It's just uh, limitless, really. The information that we glean from nature is, is slowly, slowly waking us up. And I, I really believe in that very much. Well, we've come to a, a time in 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 mankind where unfortunately there are ridiculous wars going on all around the world people feeling that they can control the planet and people feeling that they can uh control people and there is a book called Ishmael I don't know if you you're familiar with it I think Daniel Quinn wrote the book uh -huh. And he talks about the fact that one of the biggest mistakes that human humanity makes is we feel that we can control this place, that nature just <laughs> nature just flows, you know? Yeah. It is your journey, your quest now, uh, you know, in your life now, and it's the it's year 2013, how different is it or similar is it to the days when, you know, I remember seeing you at Madison Square Garden many times. Is the journey still there? Is it still as strong? Oh, for sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how much music I'm surrounded by these days um, with the Internet. You can be in touch with people all around the world making music, connecting with people around the world, making music. Um, you know, one day I'm doing sort of symphonic songs, and the next day I'm doing a reggae song, and the next day I'm doing sort of electronic music songs. So in a way, I feel like I've discovered this incredible Pandora's box of music, and it's just wonderful 
to be alive and, and, and kicking and ready to do things. And at the same time, realizing when you travel, you know, we were in Brazil a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, me and my wife we went and I did some shows in Brazil and Argentina. But the people are so happy. You know, the people are really, really, of course, you've got at the back of the minds, you've got the problems with the government and the corruption. They know all about that. But inside, they just have this wonderful, outgoing, fun energy. And, and, and you can tell by the way they speak. It's very sing song speaking. No matter who you meet, you know, you meet people on the road in the in, in bars or in uh, marketplaces and places like that, they're so happy. And when you see that, you come back to America and you just want to let people know, hey, it's easy to be happy. It's it's fun to be happy and it's good to be happy and work on it. You know, it's part of life. Well, there is, there's a lot that I'd love to talk with you about, but uh, I want to g- go into a, a state of flow. I mean, I wrote some questions down and I thought, you know, let's just have a conversation and see what emerges. Um, I can recall a day when I was living in north, northern New Jersey and I needed to clear my head. And I, uh, this was before there were CDs. I, I went for, for a drive and I listened to two records that you, you made um, in my car and just went for a drive into the mountains and cleared my head. And it was uh, fragile and uh, close to the uh, no, it was fragile on the Yes album. And I remember feeling as if the music just resonated with nature. There was no distraction the me- from melody to rhythms to harmony. I just felt I felt all of what I was seeing uh, in in the words and music and arrangements that it, you had done. Is that something that you were going for, or or did it just happen? I think really we were in a very very good place, both uh, musically and harmonically. We were friends. Uh, the business really hadn't infiltrated into our world we were just very lucky musicians that were creating music that was in in some ways very fresh and very different and I remember those days very clearly uh, it was like gosh it was just an amazing feeling going to going to the studio because you knew everybody was so in harmony and so the engineer Eddie offered and the, the place that had Vision Studios in London, and the energy was just so, um, it was right on the money. It was right, it was real. It was uh, in harmony. I people want, people wanted to make music because they wanted to make music. They had something. It had nothing to do with money or the business or whatever. It was just making music. And the record company executive guy, Armand Ertiger, who was the boss, of Atlantic, he said, you, you just do what you want to do, John. And I said, thank you very much. There was no pressure at all. So the music just came out very, very free and very clear, and it still survives. You know, you listen to it now. Uh, I haven't listened to Fragile or, or Close to the for a while, but I know, uh, you know, we put it on and you listen to it and go, okay, I remember that feeling that I had when I heard the mix at the end of the the, the whole two month period you you sat back and you listen to the mix out of the speeches and you say, "Wow, that's pretty pretty good. Listen to everybody everybody's playing so good, and you can hear every note and the the song the lyrics and everything. It was magic well it's uh, you know I remember a conversation with Tom Dowd, the engineer and producer from Atlantic in New York, and he said. Something like, he said, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder are blind. They cannot see what a video on MTV looks like, nor do they want to. When they play and they write, it's feeling, it's emotion. It's raw emotion. And that's what I've, I've always felt that music is the, other than love, it's the most universal language. It appeals to everyone. I mean, there's a scene in, 
in the film The Shawshank Redemption, uh, where um, the character starts playing opera, and the, the warden of, of the prison doesn't want him to do that, and all of yeah. a sudden everyone stops. Yep. I saw that last week. Oh, really? Yeah. See, you know the scene I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Oh, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's it's let's let's talk about the flow because that really intrigues me. Is do you feel that we as as, as humans are like an avatar or a um, a conduit for the energy of music and song. Do you, do you think it's we're chosen? Because not everyone has. I mean, I think we all have the creativity within us, but some people are just really able to um, demonstrate it better in, in a state of flow without pressure. Well, in some ways, you know, one of the things that I heard uh, is a writing from uh, the very early. Um, writings of uh, the Jewish books uh, probably 3,000 years ago, one of the earliest things that that was written is that the soul cannot move without music. Very, very simple idea, you know. And I've been writing songs on that basis of that over the last year, that the soul moves to music. And if the soul moves to music, then, of course, the physical self moves to music. And it doesn't have to be rock and roll or any kind of music. You know, the, the air, the, the wind that comes by, the trees that sound out. Uh, I remember uh, Ross and Roland Kirk explaining how music is everywhere. And everything is music. Even the crazy city sounds, it's music. Crazy music, but it's still tonality, it's still vibration energy. So when I make music, I just feel like I'm connecting with what I call uh, the divine God, whatever you want to put it. I think it's all part of our wonderful life experiences. Is there something you'd like to say to inspire the the young generations and the future generations of creators? To, to do something that's in tune with flow and and harmony? Practice. <laughs> practice, 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 and then practice more. And if you're open, the music will come through you. It's, it's part of the... Uh, I'm working with a young, a young guy, 70 years old, local guy. He's, he's coming in about half an hour. And... Uh, He's creating a, a sort of guitar concerto, and it's his first attempt. And I'm helping him design it. And uh, watching him play, sometimes I just say, don't think about it, just play. And he'll, he'll come up with some most beautiful lines, and we'll record it. And I say, right, now learn what you just play. I remember years ago working with Steve Howe, we were doing a song called It'll come to me what the song is called. And uh, he was playing just the chords on the guitar uh, as we sang the song. I sang the song. And I said, Steve, don't play the chords. Just play free-form guitar ideas. So we go through the song, and he played ideas. And then I think it was the third take. He played the most incredible guitar work for about three minutes. And I said, that's it. You listen to it back. And I said, Steve, can you learn everything you played? Because everything you played there is magnificent. And, of course, he he said, yes, I'll learn it. And he learned every note that he played. Um, Turn of the century is the song. Mm -hmm. And it's just knowing that what he was playing was spontaneous music. And if you learn that spontaneous music, that is the clearest work you can ever do. So in in a state of um, writing uh, words, writing lyrics, does it just flow through that way too? You don't know it just happens. Yeah, I like I like to think that uh, if I, I don't overthink anything on, on the lyrical side because I think it's something subconscious. You know, um, I was singing a song yesterday, 
music from a guy in Italy. Uh, very beautiful piano music with orchestra. And uh, the day before, I'd been watching a, a Russian movie about um, orphan children. And it was a pretty sad state of mind when, you know, you see these young children uh, begging for love and begging for some connection with these people that come to choose the orphans, you know. And the music was perfect for that kind of feeling. So all I did was start the song with Yesterday I I Saw a Movie. Orphans, very sad. Orphans, very wanting and waiting to be loved. Those are lyrics that just sort of came, you know. So it, it can work that way, you know, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, I'm able to still make and create. I'm very, very, very happy about what's happening. That, that's wonderful. It, uh, you, it just affirms something I, I've, I've uh, believed for many, many years. I, uh, about, 12, about 12 years ago, I had an idea to, to make a record to honor my friend Les Paul, and we set out to uh, release a record on, uh, on uh, EMI, uh, not knowing that the president of the label and half the staff would wind up leaving. But uh, we made this record, and uh, Les and I were having this conversation about art and and music and vibration. So I said to him, well, you know, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony, Death. And he said, Stephen, how can anyone write music if they can't hear it? I said, I think he could feel it. He could feel the notes and the vibrations that each note had in relationship with everything else. Now, yes, that, that, that's genius, but I feel that what's missing, and I think this is where the hope uh, comes in for what's going on in the world now. In, in the 1960s, when I grew up, we, had, we were going to the moon, we had... Uh, civil rights wars, you know, you and I are about 10 or 15 years apart. Um, but growing up in the New York area, every night we had something to look forward to. When the newspaper came in at night, we saw what happened uh, on the trip to the moon, and we'd see it on television, and we would dream like a Jules Verne story. We would dream. And that that curiosity, that innate um, sense of of wonder and awe, I think needs to be reinstated in, in society, and nothing does that better than music. Do you? How do you feel about that? Well, that's true, you know. And in so so many ways, I have this great belief there are so many young very talented musicians out there and thankfully they're free from the, the domination of record company executives who just want to make money quick and just use musicians quickly. Well, you were so, fortunate you had Amit in those days and the yeah. team, and you had the team of Atlantic with Jerry Wexler and I mean that was that was an amazing time to have a major label deal. Oh, for sure. And, and the, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is that um, the more these young people create, the more they will create the next level of um, music and energy. And, you know, in, in point of fact, you know, you have music all over the world, the indigenous music. I started thinking just then of the uh, this uh, wonderful music that the pygmies in, uh, in a certain part of uh, Africa, these tribes, they go around every day, they sing all day long. And they sing with the obviously the the monkeys are shouting and the the birds are singing and they're singing and it's uh, this wonderful cacophony of sound and I've started mimicking it and doing ideas around that idea. So in, in some ways it's not that we need to create anything new. It's just that we need to create the next level of musical consciousness, which in, in turn will sort of wake us up a little bit. I always believed that uh, the Beatles, uh, All You Need Is Love, which was actually, I only found this out uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
was what uh, Krishna said. All you need is love. It's an amazing that, that they sang it, and it just sort of resonated around the world. And uh, it's it's kind of amazing that uh, music can do that. And lyrics, songs that come along, you know, uh, songs that you two do and uh, sing. Um, it's a sort of modern day pop, which is very fast and furious pop music, which is pretty cool. But it's it is not to me. It's not everlasting music. Um, but there are musicians out there that will create the next level of music. I believe they need, they need to be inspired to do that. And what you just said can really inspire people to do that, to, to, to listen to their hearts and their intuitions, and, and uh, that, uh, that their words can make a difference and their arts can make a difference. Um, when you when you wake in the morning, uh, are are there songs or there melodies in your head? Oh, const sorry, constantly. Um, sometimes I'll just go and put them down on the piano, but it's just one of those things. That the music is always there. Um, I feel very connected to. I'm very open. You know, I've been listening to uh, Vaughan Williams uh, this last uh, week. Um, Vaughan Williams was uh, this wonderful English composer and uh, he was very, very um, structurally, very, very, very strong musically. Uh, he, he would actually use uh, folk songs uh, to, to sort of uh, make into his music, you know, to develop the music from folk songs. Most people do, uh, most uh, composers do. Um, but he went through a terrible experience in World War One, so his music after that became so dark and very, very rigid and very strange, and people didn't like it. But he went through hell, you know, and then he, he did an incredible piece of music uh, based on Thomas Tellis, uh, who was a sort of 18th century composer, and he did this beautiful Tellis Fantasia, which is Enlightenment. So out of his darkness, enlightenment came. So, like I say, I think musicians will, will do will do their best by listening to a lot of different kinds of music, and you know, it's just the way life is. Well, get, getting back to um, the you know the concept of wonder and the sense of awe and the beautiful uh, feelings I I always and still have when I listen to whether it's something that you did in the 70s or whether it's something that you've done recently, uh, such as the piece Open, um, there is a, a sense of calm as if you were in total peace. And I think that when people, if more people were in total peace, we wouldn't have as many problems. Do you agree? And is there something that you could offer as a suggestion to the world to kind of get that peace inside? Well, it's a very, it's a very, a very difficult question here. Um, but my main thing is that, first of all, I believe that we are all connected as one. We are all very, very powerful. We all have the same light inside. And we all have the same godness within. And you don't, you don't have to rush out there to find anything. It's all within. And that calmness of meditation or prayer is very healthy. I think if you get into that routine, you know, if people get into a routine of going on a bicycle, going for a run, going to the bar, drinking a lot, you know, routines and routines. But they forget that the routine that is possibly the most important is the inward so silence, you know, it's one of silence is golden, they used to say. And I think that is a very, very good key for life and evolving your life experience is to be able to, you know, just for 15 minutes a day or twice a day, you go on into deep, relaxing silence of reflection and meditation and concentrate on really nothing and try to try to stop that crazy mind which keeps telling you this and telling you that. 
That is the difficult thing, finding that calmness. And that will help you in so many ways. I remember David Lynch making a statement that if if everyone in the world did transcendental meditation at the same time, there would be peace, there would be no war. And kind of he has a, a bit of a point there, but enacting that is not going to be an easy thing. Um, the the journey, the sense of awe, beauty, peace, nature, love, all that that I've always sensed about what you do and have done and will do uh, is also reflected in the artwork that was on your uh, on the album covers. I'd like to. I never asked anyone or did, never knew the answer, and I'd rather go directly to you and ask you: How did the meeting of you you guys and Roger Dean? Uh, come about. It was just such a the 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 the, the art just really reflected what was uh, on the vinyl, you know. Yeah, it was a very interesting time. It was probably 1969, and around that time, there was an album cover of a band. The band was called Osibisa, uh, sort of a African style band that lived in in London. And this album cover was so beautiful. And uh, me and Steve uh, just, we actually were, we were in a shop called the Virgin Record Shop. It was owned by Richard Branson. That was, he had a, a corner shop just around the corner from where we rehearsed. And uh, that was his first shop, uh, selling records and uh, old records and second-hand records. And this Osibisa cover just, just really hit us very strong. We found out Roger Dean. We found his phone number. Steve called him up. And the next minute he came to London. And we were working on uh, Fragile at the time. And uh, he said, what's the album called? And I said, Fragile, because life and band, a band experience is very fragile. It's, it's not as solid as people think. And so he said, okay. That month later, it came back with the album cover, which is this beautiful planet uh, with all the trees and the rivers and things. And from then on, it was like, well, Roger, we're doing a, an album called uh, Close to the Edge. Can you come and listen to the music? And we'd actually send in demos of ideas and uh, topographic oceans and um, case of delirium, relayer. Of course, these albums, we just sent in demos and he would come along with some beautiful paintings. And it was just, there wasn't many takes of it? I mean, did he come back with uh, pretty much what, what you guys felt it, w- it was right for? He just hit, hit it every time, he hit nail on the head. It was really, really very special. In fact, we started using some of his artwork to go on stage and presentation of the show. He actually came on tour for the... Uh, the Relayer Tour, where we did Gates of Delirium. They had this incredible dragon or sword sort of painted behind us and everything. And uh, it was quite an experience in working on stage design with his brother. So all in all, that, that period of four or five years, we were all very, very connected as people. Well, I was re-listening to Gates of Delirium today, and then, of course, uh, the ending part of it uh, uh, soon. Uh, what were you trying to uh, state in in uh, you know Gates Delirium? Um, it, it to me it feels as I mean there's a part in it which which kind of reminds me of listening to Stravinsky where there's a bit of abruptness going on. You know a lot of there's beautiful melodies and there's turbulence and all of a sudden out of the turbulence comes this most beautiful light like the biggest sun you've ever seen is there well, I, think, I think you said it you know a lot of the music that we put together i was always very very concerned about stage presentation like theater putting on a show people hearing music for a long period of time and going through an experience as we'd started to do with uh, songs from fragile and close to the edge topographic conscience and of course, Case of Delir, I actually wrote a lot of it on the piano and sang it to the band and played terrible piano. 
But I had this iron rhythm going on in my head, and I, I sorted it out and I played it. And I'd, I'd obviously been listening to Stravinsky and uh, and uh, just wanted to do something really uh, for a stage presentation where we really sort of resurrect and uh, out of this darkness, we create a, a musical darkness that's so, so powerful coming out of the, the rage and rage of war and the rage of the machine of war. And all of a sudden, we go into the deep, darkest place in this theme that... Uh, Rick, uh, actually, it was, uh, it was Pat Moraz who played the keyboards. This, this theme would come out, da, 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 and the steel guitar is really, really very evil sounding to me. And we recorded it, and I said, this is going to be great on stage because out of this chaos, total chaos, we're going to calm right down and sing this song about light. Soon, oh, soon the light pass within and soothe this endless night. And that was the idea, is to go into this wild, and every night on stage I was, I, I was drumming along with Alan like a crazy guy, smashing sounds, uh, electronic. Uh, we actually had, uh, what are those things that come down uh, stairs, the little round wire things? Uh, anyway, we stretched them out put microphones on them and hit them hard and they make incredible thunder. And on stage I was going through, uh, I don't know, an exorcism every night. And then I'd come out at the end and, and get the guitar and, and take a deep breath and start singing soon or soon the light. Because I thought the audience went through it as well. You know, I know we did. I mean, it's, I it's interesting that you, you were listening to Stravinsky before writing that part. Yeah, it's interesting because when I was listening to it, I, to me, it was like, this is the only time in the music I've ever I've listened to that you've written and performed, where I actually felt dissonance. And the only compose there's two composers, there's three I actually think of, uh, Schoenberg or or uh, or uh, Wagner or Stravinsky. And where I, where I just think total power but dissonance at the same time. Well, with Wagner, of course, you have melody, but you also have dissonance. But it's amazing how I, I just heard exactly what you were, you were saying. It was it was Stravinsky. How did the words come about, though? I mean, those are those are some of the most beautiful words I've ever I've ever experienced. Which one? The, well, the first, the first section is, is really, soon. Oh, soon, of course, soon. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those things. I, 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 I've written all these very, very warlike musical, lyrical energies, and then soon, or soon, the light became like a pathway for me to write something that was very, very simple, very clear. And we actually wait here in this wonderful lifetime to be connected with the divine. We wait here for you. And it's our reason to be here. Our reason to be here is to find the divine. And that's what the song is saying. That no matter what, no matter what we go through, the only reason we live is to find the divine light within and the connection to our understanding of God. Ta-da! <laughs> well, uh, a, a friend of well, mine. No, I gotta go. <laughs> oh, you have to go now. No, no, I'm just. Oh, 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 okay. The um, a friend of mine uh, who wrote a lot of uh, lyrics for some of the uh, Wilson Brothers and the Beach Boys, Stephen Kalinich, once told me this this story that he had read a quote, some that uh, uh, Bach. You know, be a mighty organ player and uh, wonderful composer said uh, about his music, all for the glory of God. And myself being a keyboard player and mostly an organist, when if I played Bach, you you just feel this majesty of divinity floating uh, uh, totally within you. It, 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 growing up, though, it was uh, what was it like? Did your parents show you this? How, how did this? 
this being come to, I mean how did this way of thinking and belief come to you at an early age? Well, it really wasn't until I was about 25 or 6 that I read a couple of books that really changed my understanding of myself. And one was uh, The Finding of the Third Eye by Vera Stanley Alder. And uh, the other book was um, Journey to the East and Siddhartha. Herman Hess was very, very uh, relevant for me because in those books it explains that all religions are like rivers going to the same ocean. And uh, from that moment onwards, I was a seeker on the path, and I put it into the songs that I was writing. Uh, Starship Trooper, um, all these songs have this sort of metaphor for higher understanding. And uh, it's just the way things became. You know, you, you, you spend time trying to meditate and trying to meditate, and then I was very fortunate in 1987, it's, you know, 20 years later, I, I met this little lady who was uh, from Honolulu, and uh, she was staying in a small house near the airport for a few days doing meditation with people. And I went along, and uh, I knew right away that she had a higher connection to the divine and I was in the presence of a higher higher being and she was a little old lady, a little bit like my mother and it was just wonderful to sit and, and, and uh, learn and uh, go into meditation with her. She taught me how to meditate and from that moment, I think the first thing she said to me, which is priceless, she said, God is free. Did you know that, John? And I looked at her and said, thank you. At last, <laughs> the truth. At last, the truth. Sometimes so many people wind up just confusing so much truth with so much noise. When it's all found, all you got to do is open your eyes and look at nature. Very true. What what's uh, the uh, not too distant future about? You're you're working, you're collaborating with people in different regions. Every day. Beautiful. I'm working with people and uh, start rehearsing uh, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to uh, do my solo show in Australia and New Zealand, and then in the summer, me and my wife Jane are going on a holiday. It's our twentieth anniversary. And then probably, I hope, do some shows in Europe. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, um, your music has been a, a wonderful, wonderful inspiration to millions of people. And it will live on uh, forever in, in the hearts and souls of everyone you've been you know, blessed to touch. So I wanted to say thank you for that and... Uh, I will be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank ha you. Have a beautiful day. Yeah, go Niners. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the Super Bowl. <laughs> well, very important. Very important. The most important thing in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. You're living in Northern California, by the way, right? Central, yes. Yeah. More central near San Luis Obispo. And you, you're you now a citizen of the United States? Uh, yes, I became. Okay, wish you well. Thank you, sir.